Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar, Current State of Pharmacogenomics and Its Future. I'm Christy Jewell of LabRoots, and I'll be your moderator for today's event. Today's educational web seminar has been organized by Thermo Fisher Scientific using the LabRoots platform. To learn more about Thermo Fisher Scientific's products and services, please visit their website at thermofisher.com. Now, as a reminder, today's webinar is educational and thus offers free continuing education credits. Please click on the continuing education credit icon on the far left of your screen to obtain your credits. We encourage you to participate today by submitting any questions you may have during the presentation. To do so, simply type them into the Ask a Question box and click Send. We will answer as many of your questions as we have time for at the end of the presentation. Also, if you experience any technical questions, you can utilize this QA box and we will assist you directly. I'd like to now cordially welcome today's speaker, Dr. Ray Lorenz, Director, Medical Science Liaison, Neurology and Pharmacogenomics in the Division of Medical Affairs at Quest Diagnostics. For a complete biography of Dr. Lorenz, please visit the biography tab at the top of your screen. Welcome, Dr. Lorenz. The floor is yours. Thank you, Christy, for that introduction. I really appreciate it. Uh, as she said, we are going to talk about pharmacogenomics, what it looks like today, and then what it hopefully will look like in the future. Uh, first, I'd like to start with my disclosures slide. It's before you go. And then I want to go through our agenda for the day. So first, I'd really like to review our uh, recent pharmacogenomic guidelines that have been published by the CPIC organization. And then secondly, I'd like to go through some of the literature that's out there regarding mental health and polypharmacy utility of pharmacogenomics. And then finally, I'd like to kind of discuss some of the barriers uh, that we see currently in pharmacogenomic adoption and ways to hopefully counter those. But first, I'd like to talk a little bit about what pharmacogenomics is. Pharmacogenomics is the science of using somebody's genetics to help pick medications or medication doses for them a little better. Uh, there is lots of literature out there to support the fact that genetic variations do impact how patients respond to medications. And so we do have guidelines that can help us to teach us how to use those gene drug interactions for our patients. So where does pharmacogenomics fit when we talk about kind of the landscape of um, uh, clinical practice? Well, we have two kind of things that are going on right now. We have pharmacokinetics, which is how the body affects the medication. So really here we're talking about metabolism. And then we have how the medication affects the body, uh, which is called pharmacodynamics, which really has to do with receptors or transporters and not so much metabolism there. And then pharmacogenomics can tell, tell, you, tell us how pharmacokinetics and pharmacodynamics interact in a specific patient to help us pick medications better for that patient. One thing I always like to point out, though, is that pharmacogenomics is never used in a vacuum. It's never used by itself. It is just a tool that we can use in combination with lots of other patient and societal related factors to help us pick that medication better for a patient. So we're not throwing away all of the stuff we learned in school about how to treat our patients. We're using pharmacogenomics to supplement that information. Um, and you can see lots of the different ways that we choose medications for patients and all of the different factors that go into that. Uh, but one thing I always like to, to mention here is that pharmacogenomics is um, like trying to uh, figure out how <sighs> we interact with all of these different pieces. Um, and when we're picking a medication for a patient, a lot of times we're trying to think of it as finding a needle in a haystack. And what pharmacogenomics does is it doesn't tell you exactly where the needle is, but it does remove some of the hay. So that's a little easier to find that specific medication or that needle. Why is this important? Well, because Adverse drug reactions uh, account for a lot of different uh, societal issues. We have um, emergency department visits that are involved here, and then also fatalities, over 100,000 fatalities every uh, year um, due to drug interaction or drug uh, reactions. So by using patients' genetics, uh, we can help improve the effectiveness and decrease the side effect profile for our patients. Uh, one thing I do like to point out here is that 
we know that not all patients respond the same to all medications, right? And so what pharmacogenomics does is it can help us parse out which patients are going to benefit from a medication, which patients are not going to benefit from that medication, or which patients are going to have side effects to a medicine and which ones won't. So how does pharmacogenomics work? Well, first we would take a sample from a patient, either that's blood, uh, saliva, or a, a buccal swab, and we use that uh, genetic material to uh, genotype that patient. Uh, and at Quest, we do it for 44 different genes, and that includes hundreds of different alleles here. And those 44 genes are ones that are potentially important for medication therapy. Uh, the results are then presented in a report uh, that describes the genotype, the phenotype, and then which alleles we're testing. One interesting thing about Quest report is that we do not include medication guidance on our report. So we want to make sure that we're leaving the clinician to practice medicine and that not something the lab is doing. Uh, but the good thing about our results is that they can be used uh, in clinical decision support systems or electronic medical records that are set up to receive these, this discrete data uh, to help guide the medication selection using those systems. Uh, and then with the CDSS and EMR, it uses various published literature, guidelines, product labels, and the FDA's table of pharmacogenetic associations to generate uh, gene drug information. And then pharmacists or other healthcare professionals can review these recommendations to help us uh, pick medications a little better for our patients. I do want to go over some terminology really quickly here when we talk about some of these pharmacokinetic uh, genes and pharmacokinetic phenotypes. Um, I'll talk a lot about metabolism. And one thing um, I, I like to joke about is that metabolism is not how quickly we break down our food, uh, in this context at least. We're really talking about here how our uh, bodies break down the medications specifically. Uh, one other thing I'll mention is that there is a concept of what we call phenoconversion which is where we have drug interactions that are increasing or decreasing the activity of these enzymes beyond what our genetics say that it should be. And that's called drug-drug gene interactions. And so we have four kind of categories of phenotypes possible for patients that uh, do the uh, pharmacogenetic testing. And so first we have normal, um, and so that's normal metabolism. It means that there is a uh, normal amount of parent medication and metabolite uh, available in that patient's body. Uh, and then all the way to one end, we have poor metabolizers. And so poor metabolizers have little to no metabolism going on through that pathway um, in, in their liver. And then, uh, which means that we're going to have a lot more of the parent drug and a lot less of any metabolites that are created from the metabolism. And then on the other end of the spectrum, we have ultra rapid metabolism which means that patients are breaking down these medications that go through that specific pathway very, very quickly. Uh, and we have a lot of metabolites available, but not a lot of the parent compound available for action in the body. So I'd like to go through some of the more recent guidelines from CPIC. I'll talk about what CPIC is or who CPIC is, and then we can talk about kind of some of the more recent guidance that has come out uh, from, from CPIC. So CPIC is the Clinical Pharmacogenetics Implementation Consortium, and that's a mouthful, which is why I'll continue to just call it CPIC. Um, CPIC has a standard system for grading levels of evidence uh, for gene-drug pairings and uses this uh, to present guidelines for clinicians to use. Um, they do genotype to phenotype conversion. So what is your gene uh, genes say for, to what does your phenotype look like, whether it's a fast metabolizer, slow metabolizer, that kind of thing. And then they also link those phenotypes. If a patient's a you know, poor metabolizer, what happens to, to, to the medications there? Do we need to adjust the doses? Should we not use it? That kind of thing. So that's really what we're talking about here. We're talking about linking phenotypes to prescribing recommendations. The big thing here, though, is I, um, I want to make sure to mention that the guidelines don't provide information on who to test, like which patients need to be tested or, or should be tested, only what to do if the pharmacogenomic results are already available. The great thing about CPIC is that the guidelines are published uh, and freely available on their website, uh, and that's right there for you, the cpicpgx.org. Um, and so all of the guidelines that are published are published in peer-reviewed journals, and they're available for anybody to look up on their uh, website. So I'm going to look at four of the new guidelines or updates that have been created for 
pharmacogenomics uh, with CPIC. Uh, first, we'll take a look at clopidogrel or Plavix with uh, CYP2C19. We'll look at some of the opioids and CYP2D6. We'll look at um, glucose 6-phosphate dehydrogenase or G6PD. And then we'll also find a look at statins and SLC01B1. So the clopidogrel guidelines have been recently updated. Uh, they were done in uh, late uh, 20-teens and then um, were recently updated uh, this last year. Uh, clopidogrel is an antiplatelet agent that is used often for cardiovascular or cerebrovascular indications. And then an uh, interesting thing here is that it's a prodrug um, that is converted primarily by CYP2C19 to its active metabolite. So clopidogrel itself is not active. It doesn't do anything to inhibit platelet aggregation, uh, but only its, act and its active metabolite is the one that actually is doing the work here. So if you are a patient that does not have a good metabolism through CYP2C19, such as a poor or intermediate metabolizer, those patients, uh, when they receive clopidogrel, have been shown to be at an increased risk of um, potential cardiovascular events or strokes uh, beyond what they've already had, because most of the time we're using these after a heart attack or a stroke. So the recommendations in the CPIC guidelines include um, choosing an alternative platelet agent uh, for those patients that have had uh, acute coronary syndrome or, and or uh, percutaneous uh, coronary intervention or PCI. Um, one interesting thing to note here is that prasugrel is actually contraindicated in patients that have a stroke. Uh, so you couldn't, wouldn't want to use that for those types of patients. Um, one other thing that has been shown recently in the literature that uh, CPIC made to, to mention was that using higher doses of clopidogrel um, in an attempt to try to increase the amount of metabolite that's available in those um, intermediate and poor metabolizers doesn't really show any benefits. So increasing the dose for clopidogrel in this, in this context isn't really going to, to do much for that patient. It's really best to switch uh, to a different agent if you're going to be uh, using uh, or going to be needing platelet uh, inhibition for intermediate or poor metabolizers at 2C19. Next, I'd like to talk a little bit about the opioids and CYP2D6. Uh, tramadol and codeine are two big ones that are primarily metabolized by CYP2D6. Uh, and so codeine and tramadol are uh, active parent entities but uh, through metabolism by 2D6, they're converted to even more active metabolites, um, almost like prodrugs, but not quite because the parents are active. So here we have um, the, pro, uh, the uh, active metabolite for tramadol is called O-desmethyltramadol, and then morphine is actually produced from, from codeine by 2D6. So the issue here is that patients who are ultra rapid metabolizers um, at CYP2D6 can become very quickly toxic on these medications with these uh, active metabolites and have really bad side effects such as respiratory depression. And then poor metabolizers, um, because they're not getting a lot of that active metabolite, are not going to potentially achieve their therapeutic benefit, which would be you know, pain control in this, in this case. So the recommendations from CPIC are to avoid using these medications in poor ultra-rapid metabolizers. Um, and then in intermediate metabolizers, the uh, avoidance of these medications is optional um, and using potentially something other uh, in the opiate class, if those are needed, that is not metabolized by CYP2D6, something like morphine or hydromorphone. Next, we can talk a little bit about hydrocodone and oxycodone. Uh, both of those are also metabolized by CYP2D6, but to um, not as great a degree as they are for uh, see what for the tramadol and codeine. And so when you look at the CPIC guidelines, they mentioned that uh, only hydrocodone really has optional guidance for intermediate or poor metabolizers to avoid it. Um, and that oxycodone specifically was not uh, mentioned as far as needing dose, adjustment, uh, dose adjustments or avoiding it in 2D6 um, poor intermediate metabolizers. The guidelines also reviewed two pharmacodynamic genes, which one is OPRM1, which is the mu opiate receptor gene, and COMT, which is the catechol O methyltransferase gene. Um, but there was not enough evidence, um, according to CPIC, to make any clinical recommendations based on these pharmacodynamic genes. And so I'm sure that there'll be more to come with that um, in the future when, as we kind of learn more about how these pharmacodynamic uh, 
gene changes can affect patients' requirement for uh, pain control. Uh, glucose 6-phosphate dehydrogenase, or G6PD, also has uh, recently updated guidelines. Um, and so patients who are deficient at this enzyme have an increased risk for acute hemolytic anemia, which is, um, you know, potentially a, a problem, obviously, for those patients um, and is a really big issue when you have uh, a patient is, is stressed. And by stress, quote unquote, we mean uh, anything that is kind of altering the, the, the body. And so here, um, in this case, it can be caused by specifically medications. The patients most likely to have G6PD um, issues are um, Asian or African ancestry, but it can happen in, any, in anybody. Um, and so the guidelines do recommend using the genotype, but also looking at the G6PD activity uh, using uh, various phenotyping methods there. The guidelines do classify medication as high, medium, or low risk. Um, and you can see there on the slide uh, kind of how those break down. Most of the medications uh, that had been previously thought to be a really huge issue with G6PD uh, have been kind of reclassified as lower risk now. Um, and so, but I have the, the list there for you guys to, to look through. Uh, finally, for the guidelines section here, I'd like to talk a little bit about the statins and SLC-01B1. Um, HMG CoA reductase inhibitors or statins are used to treat high cholesterol. And so uh, this uh, SLC-01B1 gene um, makes a protein that facilitates the statin uptake into the liver. And so patients that have a decreased function here are at a higher risk of what is considered statin-associated musculoskeletal symptom symptoms, um, or I like to say just kind of myopathy. And so if you have uh, a decreased function here, you are at a higher potential, potentially higher risk for that myopathy. Um, and then uh, there are two additional genes that are mentioned in the guidelines for other specific medications. Um, that you can kind of look through there. The, finally, I'd like to say that there is an algorithm uh, in the guidelines that are based on SLCO1B1 activity and the level of intensity of the statins, whether they're high, moderate, or low, um, and that can help to reduce the risk of SAMs. So if a patient has this kind of um, decreased function at the SLCO1B1 gene, um, it doesn't mean that they can't take statins. It just means that we may have to kind of looking, look at the dosing a little bit more closely. So after reviewing some of those guidelines, I'd like to kind of talk a little bit more about how we use uh, pharmacogenomics now um, in, in the clinic. And most often I see it being used in mental health circumstances. And so I'll, I'll do a little bit of a brief literature review, looking at kind of the data that's out there looking uh, at this, the mental health indications for pharmacogenomics. Uh, the first study that I'd like to talk about here um, was a uh, study that looked at um, a few hundred patients and looked at patients that were receiving pharmacogenomic guidance by their uh, providers versus those that weren't, which is called treatment as usual. And what they saw um, in this study was that uh, remission rates after 12 weeks were um, more than doubled uh, when you used pharmacogenomics versus when you did not. Uh, and that the number needed to treat for one additional patient to benefit from pharmacogenomic testing uh, if they have severe depression uh, is three. And so for me, that's a pretty low number needed to treat, especially when we think about how number needed, numbers needed to treat for antidepressants in general are, are about a lot higher than that. Um, and so for me, this was a, a really good study that kind of talked about how we can use pharmacogenomics for our patients that are severely depressed. Uh, another study is called the GUIDED study. This was a very large um, blinded placebo-controlled eight-week study um, in outpatients that all had treatment-resistant depression. And so again, they looked at uh, patients that had been there whose clinicians were guided by the pharmacogenomics or PGX and then treatment as usual or TAU. Um, after the eight weeks, there was no difference uh, in the symptom improvement on the HAMD scale uh, between the two arms. However, uh, there were significant differences in response rates and remission rates uh, in favor of pharmacogenomics. Uh, and the other thing for me, I think that, that really kind of drives home the, the message that pharmacogenomics is helpful, is that patients that were switched off of medications that had significant, significantly negative gene drug interactions um, showed greater improvement 
and fewer adverse effects than those that stayed on medications that were uh, not as genetically appropriate for them. And so to me, again, showing that by getting patients off of medications that are uh, have potential negative gene drug interactions, we can improve their uh, the efficacy and the side effect profile of our antidepressant medications. Um, there was another study that looked at depression um, in the community pharmacy, which I thought was uh, really interesting. Uh, and so these were patients that presented to the community pharmacy that were currently dissatisfied uh, with their depression treatment and were blinded. Um, the patients were blinded to their uh, assignment, whether they were on, they got pharmacogenomics or not. Um, and what they found was that patients in the pharmacogenomics guided group had greater improvements on the PHQ-9, which is a depression questionnaire, and the GAD-7, which is an anxiety disorder, than those in treatment as usual after six months. What I think is most interesting about this study was that prescribers were more likely to accept recommendations from the pharmacist when they knew that PGX was being used versus when they weren't um, using the PGX. So I thought to me that to me that was pretty indicative that you know clinicians do tend to use uh, pharmacogenomics and view uh, pharmacogenomics in a positive light. Um, one uh, additional thing about the study was that the payer mix did influence the acceptance of recommendations, meaning that those patients that were more uh, that had uh, better insurance or uh, more complete insurance and not uh, through state funded Medicaid were actually more likely to ha have their clinicians accept the recommendations for changes in medications. Um, uh, finally, I'd like to kind of talk a little bit about this, uh, the uh, study that was done in veterans uh, in VA medical centers over six months uh, with that had mental illness. This was a very large clinical study um, that had almost a thousand patients in both groups. What, there was pharmacogenomics versus treatment as usual. Um, what they looked at in this study were the uh, number of gene drug interactions and the remission based on THQ9. Uh, the study population was mostly uh, white men um, with a high prevalence of comorbid comorbid PTSD and other anxiety disorders. Um, and 30% of the patients did have treatment resistant depression. Um, but there was a good representation of minorities uh, in the study compared to other studies that have looked at depression um, with pharmacogenomics. The uh, outcomes showed that pharmacogenomics did help to avoid significant negative gene drug interactions. So again, showing that, that, that it did work. Um, also, the pharmacogenomics arm had a significantly greater rate of remission over the six-month trial. Um, but after six months, there was no difference between the pharmacogenomic group and the uh, treatment as usual group. And so what that really means to me is that after about six months, uh, you know, the clinicians guessed right on their patients' medications, but those that were guided by pharmacogenomics got better quicker. Um, and to me, that's that's worth the, the the use of that just because they're of use of pharmacogenomics because we're able to do a lot of um, getting the patients better faster. The uh, also response and uh, uh, rejection in symptom severity did favor pharmacogenomics, um, but pharma the uh, treatment resistant depression PTSD and race all affected how high the remission rate was uh, versus higher high or low based on that. So patients that had higher levels of comorbid PTSD um, and were not white um, had lower rates of remission. So as I said, the pharmacogenomics guided group did show a faster remission rate, but treatment as usual caught up after that six months. Um, this study did primarily enroll patients from psychiatry clinics. Um, and so that to me says something that there, there are a lot of um, studies out there that look at how pharma or that uh, PCPs or primary care practitioners are more likely to benefit from pharmacogenomics than psychiatrists are, uh, especially in community uh, dwelling settings. Um, there was no assessment in the study of treatment emergent adverse effects. And that's important because one of the big reasons we do pharmacogenomics is to help patients not have as many side effects, but this wasn't assessed in the, in the study. Uh, also, as I mentioned earlier, there was a higher rate of um, ethnic diversity in this than other studies. Um, and um, one of the things that I think about here could be because a lot of the traditional pharmacogenomic tests are based on mostly Caucasian data, um, that this could be a reason why race did play a role in the remission rates. <laughs> 
And so sometimes people think of this as a potential negative trial for pharmacogenomics because after six months, there was no difference between the pharmacogenomics guided group versus the treatment as usual group. But again, as I mentioned, I really don't think it is because what we saw was that the patients that got pharmacogenomics guided treatment was were got faster, better. So, or better, faster, I should say. Uh, the last study I'll review as far as efficacy for um, pharmacogenomics and depression was a, me a meta-analysis um, that looked at um, 13 different trials <clears throat> here, uh, and all of these had to be prospective controlled trials assessing, assessing the efficacy of pharmacogenomics and depression. Um, in the meta-analysis, there was some bias detected. Most of these were industry-sponsored, uh, potential reporting bias, and performance bias as well. But um, looking at all 13 of these studies, um, the relative risk of all trials was 1.41, which basically means that patients were 41% more likely to achieve remission using pharmacogenomics than they were if they did use treatment as usual. Um, and so to me, that's pretty good data when you kind of look at all of these different studies taken together, you're more likely to have remission if you use pharmacogenomics than if you don't. Um, and then this study also looked at that the number of trials of antidepressants, uh, as the number of antidepressant trials increased and the average depression severity increased, so did the risk ratio in favor of pharmacogenomics. So basically those patients that have tried and failed a few different medications and have more severe depression, potentially are more likely to benefit from pharmacogenomics. I do wanna talk about some of the economic outcomes that have been seen with depression um, and, and pharmacogenomics. So. Um, the reductions in pharmacy costs over one year um, in patients that were uh, general patients that were depressed, um, reduced costs in primary care population and elderly patients. And then there's quite a few cost effectiveness models that show that, um, that around, this, uh, around this number, about $4,000 per patient per year savings, um, indirect and indirect medical costs. So to me, that's, that's a lot of money to be able to be saved uh, potentially for our patients and not only are we saving money for the healthcare system and for our patients and providers, but we're also helping them do better clinically. The next uh, set of data that I'd like to review has to do with um, what's considered polypharmacy. Um, and polypharmacy really is the uh, meaning that patients are on multiple medications all at once. This is another place where pharmacogenomics can be very useful for a lot of uh, a lot of people. Um, looking at preventing hospital admissions, the uh, there was a meta analysis that was done looking at uh, using five studies um, to determine how pharmacogenomics helped uh, hospital admissions change over time, um, and the. Long and short of it was that there was about a 50% reduction in hospital admissions when pharmacogenomics was used versus when it wasn't. Um, and while this isn't really huge numbers of patients or huge numbers of, of studies, um, it kind of does give us a, a, a way to kind of move forward uh, with uh, looking at more research in this area. The um, most recent study that actually came out looking at adverse drug events um, in uh, using pharmacogenomics was called the PREPARE study. This was an open label trial with crossover design that was conducted over in, um, in Europe. And there were almost 7,000 patients enrolled in this study. Um, the primary outcome was looking at adverse drug events over 12 weeks. Uh, and they compared PGX to control patients who were not um, tested at that time. Um, whether or not, the clinicians followed the guidelines that they had been laid out for those patients using that. Um, I thought this was interesting that um, you know over 93% of people that they studied in this and that they looked at in the study had at least one actionable variant. Uh, so that means when we're thinking about our patient population, that our patients probably have you know most of our patients have some level of um, actionable variants in their uh, in their genome. And on average, patients were on eight medications together all at once um, on average, which I think is a pretty good number there talking about kind of polypharmacy. Um, and the most common medication that initiated the pharmacogenomic testing was st uh, a statin, which is a torvastatin, uh, followed by clopidogrel, which we talked about both of those medications. So in the patients that got pharmacogenomic testing versus those that did not, um, there were a lower rate of um, 
clinically relevant adverse drug events, leading to an odds ratio of 0.7 which basically means that there was a 30% reduction in adverse drug events um, for those patients that did pharmacogenomics versus those that did not. Um, and to me, again, that's, that's a pretty good number to reduce basically our adverse drug events by one third. Uh, that's, that's pretty good data there. Uh, looking at uh, more uh, kind of data, looking at polypharmacy patients, um, there was a, a study that was done looking at pharmacogenomics as part of a comprehensive medication management program um, that was implemented in a state retirement system for Medicare Advantage patients. So this comprehensive medication management included a review of lots of different patient factors, lifestyle, concomitant medications, illness, diet, that kind of thing, in addition to their pharmacogenomics. And all of that was done by a clinical pharmacist. Um, this medication review and pharmacogenomics review was discussed with the patient. And then the recommendations from that uh, discussion were given to the patient's provider. In this study, um, over 5,000 patients, there was a reduction of about $7,000 per patient in direct healthcare costs uh, compared to non-participants. Um, and that comes out to about $218 and change per member per month. Or for the 32 months of the study, it was over 37, almost $37 million. Um, so that's a quite a lot of money um, looking at the amount of savings that we can get by in direct healthcare costs. Uh, here with this uh, with this outcome. And then looking at healthcare resource utilization, they did see a reduction in inpatient visits, emergency department visits, and in outpatient visits. So um, showing that our patients had uh, got better and uh, saved money in the process. Uh, and then one study that we did actually in uh, our own Quest employees uh, was based on that Kentucky Teachers Retirement System study. Uh, we basically did the same type of, of setup where uh, we had uh, comprehensive medication management with pharmacogenomics uh, reviewed by a pharmacist. Uh, and then that was, was given to uh, the patient's provider. Um, this is important because the previous study that I mentioned was all in 65 and older patients. Uh, we did it in our employee population, which is significantly younger. The average age here was about uh, 44. We did an interim analysis, um, and of the 473 patients at this uh, interim analysis that uh, received a medication action plan, um, they were about uh, average of seven patients were taking about seven medications um, and at least half or over half were taking at least five medications. Um, and what we found was that 86% of patients had an actionable recommendation. Um, and what we considered an actionable recommendation was things like providing monitoring parameters for the patient's current therapy, um, discontinuing medications or and starting new medications. Those were all kind of actionable recommendations. Um, the most common medications in our patient population that had pharmacogenomic implications uh, were atorvastatin, metformin, metoprolol, and bupropion. And the reason I mention that is just to show that those are some of the more common medications that we see in general in, the, the, in all of our, our patients. Um, and interestingly, in those patients that um, did have the medication action plan done, um, the average number of pharmacogenomic medications per patient was between two and three. So that, again, shows that not only could it be used for one medication, but these patients were taking lots of different medications and could potentially benefit more uh, from the pharmacogenomic testing because they were on medications more than uh, the one medication that they originally did PGX for. Um, so to me, again, that, that just shows that kind of validates some of the data that has been seen in an older population, but in a younger population there. Um, and so I wanted to talk a little bit about kind of looking into a crystal ball and, and figuring out what does the future of uh, pharmacogenomics look like? Um, so there are going to be lots of implementation challenges as we've already faced um, in PGX, um, but op also opportunities. Um, a, a lot of uh, clinicians and, and implementers cite education as a barrier. It doesn't have to be a barrier. Patients are becoming more and more savvy and more and more aware of what pharmacogenomics uh, can, can do for them and what it is. Um, and I often have providers who are calling me up and are saying, hey, um, my patient brought in this genetic result and I don't, I don't really know what to, what to do with it. Um, and so that uh, to me shows that, that patients are becoming um, more and more aware of it and that providers really need to kind of step up their game, if you will. 
Um, using clinical decision support systems um, and EMR alerts can help integrate pharmacogenomics into practice for some, some of these providers. Um, <clears throat> one thing that I always hear though, is like the EMR interruptive alerts, these, these pop-ups are like the bane of, of providers existence. They just kind of click through them. Um, and so that's why I kind of said judicious issues um, only really when it would be super important for those, would it, would it kind of be a, a good idea to, to have those alerts. Um, and then the alerts though can be used for if to know whether a patient's already done pharmacogenomic testing or whether or not it's appropriate in a specific circumstance to use pharmacogenomic testing. Um, and then discrete results, meaning that results that are able to be downloaded into a CDSS or EMR uh, without being a PDF that lives somewhere in a lab tab uh, on, on the EMR is, is really important so that everybody who uses that um, EMR or CDSS knows that this patient has pharmacogenomics uh, results for them. Um, the other thing here is that pharmacists are some of the most accessible healthcare professionals. Um, and they are, med pharmacists are the medication experts, right? But when I think back to when I went to school, I'm not going to say how many years ago, but when I went to school, uh, pharmacogenomics was really not a big part of my education as a pharmacist. Uh, and so it's really important that we um, do some of these uh, educational uh, presentations and, and CE continuing education, that kind of thing for pharmacists so that everybody can be on the same level when it comes to pharmacogenomics as pharmacists, like I said, are the medication experts. The um, other issue that I hear is that, well, this is a once in a lifetime test, right? Well, it is, right? Because your genes don't ever really change. Um, but how do you get those that information from one person, one health system to the next health system? Um, and to make sure that that provider, that new provider knows that there was pharmacogenomics done. And as I say there, EMRs are great, uh, but they are very health system specific. And that is, um, can be a problem when you are, um, you know, have a patient who moves cities or towns or, or, or states even. Um, patients should become the guardians of their own data. Um, and one thing that they did that I thought was really cool in the PREPARE trial was that um, they used a QR code um, that anybody, if they patient presented this card with the QR code, any provider could scan it uh, and then find out what that patient's genetics resu re genetic results were. Um, and to me, that's really cool technology to be able to, to do that. And, and, you know, is that something that can be replicated? I'd, I'd love to see that, to see if it's, it can be done uh, here in the, in the U.S. Um, one other thing is to make sure that providers are asking if pharmacogenomics have been done in the past. Some patients may not know that they had it done, um, but it never hurts to ask the question. Uh, uh, one other thing that can be challenging is changing provi provider behaviors. Um, and, and attitudes. Um, you know, when I first started uh, in the pharmacogenomics area about uh, 10 or 11 years ago, um, what was, I was hearing then was, well, what I do now works for my patients really well. And, and, and so I don't really need to use pharmacogenomics. I don't, I don't think that it, it's worthwhile. Um, but now what I'm saying is, well, I, I don't use it because I don't think the data is as good as it seems. Um, so there's always resistance to new technologies. And I feel like um, there are ways that we can kind of combat that resistance. Uh, one is to not necessarily scare providers, obviously, but to talk about the legal liability um, that could potentially have a problem um, with uh, pharma not doing pharmacogenomics. Um, in fact, there was a Oregon um, uh, health system that uh, ended up being sued for DPYD, not using a specific gene to help guide chemotherapy for a patient. Uh, and so th those are kind of some examples that we could use. Um, the pharmacogenomics um, not being included in specific guidelines can be a problem um, because it leads to clinicians discounting their benefit, um, uh, the benefit of pharmacogenomics. Oh, it's not in the guidelines, so why would I want to do it, right? Um, and but um, you know, just because something's not in specific guidelines doesn't mean it can't be useful. The other thing I think that really is important are multiple multiplicitary teams are needed to aid in especially larger health systems. So we need a coalition of, of different disciplines, pharmacists, nursing, um, uh, physician champions to kind of be able to get pharmacogenomics accepted in health systems. And the best way I've seen that done is kind of starting small 
So looking at a, um, you know, one specific gene drug interaction, for instance, um, and then kind of expanding from there once that's been kind of more widely accepted. Um, and as we saw in some of the clinical studies that I reviewed, pharmacists doing, um, using C, uh, CDSS software um, can translate a lot of the uh, quote unquote mumbo jumbo that clinicians feel like pharmacogenomics is uh, into clinical action. Um, and then um, if there is a really long turnaround time between the time when the patient was, you know, the sample was taken versus when they get the results back, uh, that can limit its usefulness. Uh, and then one of the other big things that I always get asked is, um, you know, well, you know, how much does this cost, right? And so currently, you know, there are a lot of um, barriers potentially there for, for us, um, but it doesn't have to be a barrier. Um, so commercial payer acceptance has been traditionally um, or historically very, very slow here. Um, everybody wants more data um, and for clinical and economic outcomes. Uh, and, you know, the gold standard of randomized placebo controlled trials aren't necessarily feasible for some of these, um, you know, pharmacogenomic panels or even ethical, um, depending on what we're looking at here. Uh, and so that that makes it difficult. Uh, they want to see uh, commercial payers generally want to see uh, return on investment or ROI within a year. Um, and so the, the best way I feel like to be able to do that is to use algorithms to stratify patients that are most likely to benefit from pharmacogenomics so that we're only testing those patients that are likely to benefit, right? We're not just testing everybody all the time, but really only those patients that are most likely to benefit. Uh, and as we saw, uh, again, in some of the clinical studies I presented, employer-sponsored testing uh, can be a proven strategy to help kind of achieve positive healthcare outcomes um, while also achieving positive economic outcomes. Um, and then um, currently now, pharmacogenomic panels are reimbursed uh, for mental health reasons, uh, but single gene tests tend to have better reimbursement on a one-by-one uh, -one basis. Uh, as we saw in the studies that I presented, uh, most patients have at least one actionable pharmacogenomic variant um, that could impact medication outcomes. Uh, but one of the things we have to think about here is allele frequencies are uh, vary based on the patient population that we're talking about. Various ethnicities, races, all of that kind of stuff um, can be, uh, you know, an issue here because a lot of the research that's been done has not been done in a diverse population. So to conclude, um, pharmacogenomic guidelines do exist, um, and they are held to a very high evidentiary standard. Pharmacogenomics is a very, very valuable tool that does improve clinical and economic outcomes in patients that have um, you know, depression and in patients that are receiving multiple medications. Uh, and then, as I just discussed, um, when implementing pharmacogenomics, um, it can be difficult, um, but there are ways that we can overcome some of those barriers. And with that, I'll, I'll stop and we'll enter our Q&A session. Thank you, Dr. Lorenz, for your informative presentation. We will now start the live Q&A portion of our webinar. Now to our audience, if you have any questions you would like to ask, please do so now. Just click on that Ask a Question box located on the far left of your screen, and we will answer as many of your questions as we have time for. Okay, Dr. Lorenz, let's get started. Now we have quite a few questions coming in, but I would like to start with this one. Let's, what is classified as adverse drug effects? So that's a, a really good question. So adverse drug effects are anything that uh, is not what we want the drug or the medication to be doing. Um, and so that includes adverse drug reactions um, or, you know, as we call side effects, those kinds of things. So anything that um, happens that we don't want to happen um, because uh, that patient was taking that medication. Um, and they can be as, um, you know, as minimal as like nauseousness um, all the way up to and including potential death, depending on what medications we're talking about here. Um, and so there is a wide range there uh, of looking at what is considered an adverse drug effect. Uh, but uh, in general, again, it's those uh, things that happen when a patient takes a medication that we don't want to happen. Thank you for clarifying that. Our next question, where do you see pharmacogenomics being most useful? So another really good question. I think pharmacogenomics is most useful in those 
patients kind of that, that I was talking about earlier, um, in patients that have, um, you know, significant depression, um, especially uh, in those patients that potentially are taking lots of different medications, um, but also in your primary care um, practitioner office. Um, they have the potential to be prescribing lots of different medications that have pharmacogenomic implications. Uh, and so using uh, pharmacogenomics in the primary care clinic uh, can be really, really helpful for multiple areas of um, the patient's therapy. Thank you. Our next question. When assessing which alleles to test for in a PGX panel, what considerations do you have? So the alleles uh, testing in a specific pharmacogenomic panel um, obviously depend on which genes we're going to be looking at, um, but uh, there are lists of what are considered quote unquote recommended or tier one uh, alleles that need to be tested for for various different genes. Um, so definitely we want to include those um, at, at a minimum. Um, but in my mind, uh, more is, is usually better. Um, and so the more uh, alleles that we're looking for, the less likely it is that with the uh, testing will result to a default of normal, uh, because that is, the, that is the default. So if we have patients that have very, uh, or more rare variants, uh, as far as their alleles are concerned in a specific gene, um, then they're much more likely, and if you're only looking for a very minimum amount of alleles, to come up as normal when they may not be normal. Um, and so that, that to me is why, uh, more is better. Um, and I, I feel like too, you know, if um, we are trying to give uh, patients uh, the benefit of the doubt and increase our um, uh, diversity in our patients, then we are going to see a lot more of these rarer variants out there um, than we would, than we normally do see. Thank you, Dr. Lorenz. This question next has come in a few times. Why does medication management by pharmacists utilizing pharmacogenomics testing improve outcomes? So yeah, that's a really good question. And I feel like it, it does kind of bear a little bit more, uh, a, a deeper dive, if you will. Um, and, and I think it's, it's they're multifaceted really, right? So as I mentioned during the presentation, pharmacists are the medication experts, right? They're, we're the ones that go to school to learn about medications, right? So we should know uh, all of that information. Um, and then by uh, an extension of that, pharmacogenomics is a great tool that we can use to supplement all of that knowledge that we already have about um, how medications work and you know when to use them, when not to use them, all of that stuff, to be able to pinpoint which patients are going to benefit or have fewer side effects to certain medications. Uh, and so I think that by looking at the patient as a, as a whole, as pharmacists are, are trained to do, and not just looking at one specific drug, one specific gene interaction, uh, that is kind of why I think pharmacists and, and this, um, you know, using PGX do, uh, does improve outcomes greater than just doing pharmacogenomics off the top without using pharmacist intervention. And Dr. Lawrence, we have time for one more question. We'll wrap with this one. Which conferences would you recommend attending to learn more about pharmacogenomics? So there's lots of different um, uh, you know, conferences that are out there. Um, CPIC does do a conference every two years. That's a really great opportunity. Um, University of Florida also has a precision medicine uh, meeting as well, usually once uh, every year or every, or tw or every two years. Um, the um, Mayo Clinic has some some uh, meetings as well. Uh, University of Minnesota. I'm sure there's a bunch that I'm that I'm missing, but uh, there are really good um, places where you can kind of get um, to meet other uh, people who are interested in pharmacogenomics uh, and get you know some of the cu cutting edge knowledge there for you. Um, some of the bigger national meetings also do have some components of pharmacogenomics. If you look at the various specialties, like obviously oncology has um, you know lots of, of continuing education that's out there and meetings regarding, um, you know, pharmacogenomics for chemotherapy. Um, and then also looking at different, you know, in mental health um, and uh, in rheumatology, there's lots of places, but there's usually not at these larger meetings, it's very sub, it's very uh, specialized. And so, um, you know, if you want a broader pharmacogenomic education, um, going to one of those other meetings would be really, really good. Thank you again, Dr. Lorenz, for your time today and for your important research. Do you have any final comments for our audience? 
no, I just want to thank you guys for inviting me to talk and I hope uh, everybody learned something today. Thank you. Now we'd also like to thank LabRoots and our sponsor, Thermo Fisher Scientific, for underwriting today's educational webcast. Before we go, I do want to thank the audience for joining us today and for their interesting questions. Those questions we were unable to answer today and those submitted during the on-demand period will be addressed by our speaker via the contact information you provided at the time of registration. Today's webcast can be viewed on demand and Labroots will alert you via email when it's available for replay. We encourage you to share that email with your colleagues who may have missed today's live event. That's all for now. Thanks for joining us and have a great day.